Welcome back and thank you for staying tuned to the audio commentary entitled Parashat Brishit. I'm the author of the commentary, Ariel bin Lyman Hanavi. We are studying our very first Torah portion of the biblical cycle. We have started afresh with the book of Genesis and we are on page 3 if you have the written notes. We're around the middle of page 3. This is part B. Let's start with the paragraph entitled Spiritual Power. I read a verse uh, in part A from the Hebrew, um, Genesis 1, 1 and 2. I'll go ahead and read that again for you in both Hebrew and English because we're going to look at the one of the one of the Hebrew words here that's uh, particularly germane for our study. The Hebrew says, "Breshit bara Elohim et hashemayim ve'et ha'aretz v'ha'aretz ha'ita tohu v'vohu v'choshek al panei tehom v'ruach Elohim merachet al panei hamayim." The English is: In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was unformed and void. Darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the water, or over the surface of the water. Now, I want to talk about this Spirit and its hovering. This next um, section is entitled, Spiritual Power. The word translated hovered in the verse that I just read, verse 2 of chapter 1, in the Hebrew, it's merachefet. Okay? And the root word of merachefet is the word rachaf. This word rachaf, this verb, actually conveys the sense of shaking or moving or fluttering. It's translated as hovering in the passage, but according to the BDB, the Brown Driver Briggs and Justinius lexicon, um, shaking, moving, or fluttering are nuances of this word. You can look down at the bottom of page 3 to um, footnote number 1 to see what I'm talking about there. Fluttering, hovering, sounds like a bird, Yes. In fact, that is the idea behind this word, this verb. Fluttering is when a bird softly relaxes its flight to alight upon its young. You've seen the picture. You've got a nest. There's the young ones there. They're, they've got their, their heads pointed upwards. They're chirping. They're waiting for mama to bring them some food. Chirp, 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 chirp. They're just going away at it. And then in the distance, here comes mama bird with some food in her beak. And she's going to land in the nest. Well, she's not just going to go come swoop down and plop down because she might injure her young. So what she does is she, she relaxes her flight as she's coming in for a landing and she hovers over her young birds uh, and then softly comes down gently um, and then you know brings them their, their, um, their provision. That is the picture that's described by the Ruach, the Spirit, as he lovingly and closely broods or, or flutters or, or, or hovers over the newly created substance that God just spoke into existence. Isn't that a neat picture that the, that, that, that's painted by this Hebrew verb, Rachaf? Now, how is it that I understand, or how do I come to know that this is the nuance uh, behind this verb? Well, this verb is found three times in Scripture. Okay, and it's defined as hovering only one other time in the entire Tanakh. Let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 10 and 11. Quote, he found his people in desert country, in a howling, wasted wilderness. He, speaking of God, he protected him and cared for him, guarded him like the pupil of his eye, like an eagle that stirs up her nest, hovers over her young spreads out her wings, takes him and carries him as she flies, end quote. You see how this is described in this other Pasuk here? The eagle who stirs uh, up her nest, hovering over her young. This is a beautiful illustration of the protective power of the Spirit of God in relation to his children, Am Yisrael, the people of Israel, as they travel through the wilderness. And as I read the passage, since it's the same Hebrew verb there, rachaf, for the word hovered, in the Devarim passage, the Deuteronomy passage, then it's easy how it can remind me of the same spirit that hovered, minachafet, over the waters at the beginning of creation. The word translated hovers in our above verse is the same root as the one used in Genesis 1-2. Rachaf, you can look it up in your Strong's. And in fact, to strengthen the connection between the two applications, between the Devarim passage and the Breshit passage, 
it, you remember every Torah portion has a counterpart Haftarah portion that has been selected by the sages so as to allow a uh, um, a similar study of the similar topics. And in the Haftarah to Breshit in Isaiah 42 verse 5 through 43.10 we're going to find something interesting there as well. Now the Haftarah portion um Complements the Torah portion in its in in basically in its uh in its content, or at least there's there's supposed to be a connection between the Haftarah and the Torah portion. I've tried to um, highlight this connection in my commentaries to the Haftarah portions that I publish um, to those who are subscribed members to my Yahoo um, group. In case you're not familiar with what I'm talking about, if you'd like to get the commentaries to the Haftarah portions, they are not available on the website at graftedin.com, and I do not record them as podcasts. Instead, you must subscribe to my weekly Torah portions if you'd like to get the complimentary Haftarah portions sent to you via email. Of course, my subscriptions are free. I never charge anything for receiving my information. If you'd like to donate, that's a different story. But I don't charge anyone to receive the information. It's always provided for free. I only ask that you subscribe to the Yahoo group um, so as to uh, allow me to send you the Haftar portion. I kind of make that a subscription-only feature. Let's move on into my commentary here. We're talking about the spirit hovering over the surface of the newly created substance that God spoke into existence. And we've seen how this word, this phrase, Merachefet, shares the root word, Rachaf, and it's used in the, book, in the Deuteronomy passage. But we find it also in Isaiah 42. That's where the Haftar portion is uh, chosen from. In this passage in Isaiah, uh, we read in the opening 17 Hebrew words a summary of the first chapter actually in Genesis let's read that here thus says God Adonai who created the heavens and spread them out who stretched out the earth and all that grows from it who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk on it end quote sounds like the Genesis passage doesn't it God created the heavens and the earth God gave us our beginning God spread out the resources that we were going to need to 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 uh, pursue and dominate the earth, uh, to to um, uh, till the ground properly and to care for it. God gave us the resources necessary so that we can survive on this planet. And then God also, according to this pasuk here in Isaiah, gives breath to the people on it. Remember, God breathed into Adam, and he became a living. Being a living spirit. God gives us our purpose. God gives us our spirit. Isn't it only fitting that we should return this back to him in sincere worship? I think it is. Let's move on now into my commentary into um, just some of the basics uh, of this Torah portion. I want to talk about some of the logistics of the creation. Let's talk about God's all-knowing and all-working power, his omniscience. This next section of my commentary is entitled Omniscience at Work. Remember, when God put the universe together, he knew in advance how it would best work together. Unlike the evolutionist model that we talked about in Part A, we find in the Torah a creator that is what? intimately interested in his creation. He didn't just whip something together, you know, via cosmic dust and proton charge and molecules and voila, there it is, and then abandon it to quote-unquote evolve on its own. You ever heard that theory purported? Yeah, sure, God created the heavens and the earth, and then he stepped back to let it evolve. No, that doesn't work that way either. His beginnings, as we stated already, carry with them meaning and divine purpose. He knows the purpose for which he created all of these things. He knows how it is designed to work together, and that's why he designed it the way he did. Let's read further into our parasha, and we see the order in which he created things. Look at uh, my notes if you have them there. Um, We are right around the middle of page four. There are seven days to the creation. If we take a literal seven-day approach, or if you can take seven time periods, it really doesn't matter. We have seven periods broken down for us. 
because that's how the the scripture reads, right? Um, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth in verse 1. And we get down to verse 5, and it says, God called the light day, and to the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning one day. And that set where it says, in the, in the evening, and, the, and there was evening, and there was morning day 2, uh, in verse 8. And there was evening, and there was morning uh, day 3, or a third day in verse 13. And on and on it goes. So we have this um, order. Okay? Let's look at our parasha and see what he created on these different time periods. On day 1... Light and darkness were created, first day. On day two, firmament and sky, second day. Dry land, seas, grass, plants, and trees were created on the third day. Stars, planets, sun and moon on the fourth day. Marine life and birds, livestock and crawling animals were created on the fifth day. And then we have the crowning creation of male and female on the sixth day, man was created. And then this unique day of rest, a time of rest and refreshing, the Shabbat was brought forth on the seventh day. Now, if we were if we had time to study this in depth, we would we would find out that the sequence of events is not randomly initiated, like the revolution. I'm sorry, like the evolutionary models would suppose they were. You know, in evolution, things just kind of happen by natural. Um, what are they called? Natural selection, you know. Uh, man crawled out of the primordial soup, and because of of natural processes, he's going to need to fend for himself. He develops teeth and claws and 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 whatever else he needs to defend himself. And then, uh, you know, the other animals develop, and and everything just kind of, um, you know, somehow came together by chance as the way it needed to be. No, that's not how it came to be. God created everything in a specific order. He created man to rule over that which he had created. And so he gave us the resources so that we could um, um, accomplish the tasks that he would uh, give to us. Later on we see that um, when man is created, God places him in the garden and uh, gives him instructions about what to eat and what not to eat, how to till the garden, things like that. Even after man sins and he's put out of the garden, the grace and the mercy of God are still seen in action because the the earth turns on its axis and it rotates about the sun at at such the precise distance and, and so that man can actually live and thrive on this planet and um, work the ground and bring forth the resources, resources that he's going to need to uh, survive. You know, man is given the means to eat and to provide for himself, clothing, shelter, um, eventually to go on to build cities and towns and things like that. God created us in a specific way. God didn't just throw it all together and hope that it would work together somehow, hoping and praying that, that the evolutionary process would somehow work itself out in the survival of the fittest. No. Everything is done with a super intellect at the helm. God is the master architect. Our galaxy is not just spinning along, drifting through the universe with no one to chart its course. Our Lord, the Lord of hosts, Adonai Tzvaut, he was there at the birth of the universe. And when all is said and done, he will be there when it comes to an end. And guess what? From beginning to end, people, he is orchestrating every minute detail. God has not turned his back on us. God realizes that we walked away from him. And so from the beginning, God set into motion the necessary factors in our history so that we can find our way back to the garden, back to God. When all of his creation has run its chosen course, God will be there to facilitate another new beginning. We don't know exactly what that looks like. You can read the book of Revelation and speculate. But God will be there. God will never, ever leave. So, I spent quite a bit of time discussing the details of creation versus evolution. I'm not an apologist in this area. If you'd like more information, there are plenty of Christian apologists that you can... um, you know, get their resource materials, evolution versus creation, and uh, I'm sure there's a lot of information that could be spoken of, but it's, it's, this is not the time and the place for that, and I'm not the one to be able to do that. But I've spent enough time here in my commentary to give us um, 
a framework for understanding that we should choose creation, that we should choose God. And you know what? The consequences of choosing the wrong system can be detrimental. If you choose God, it can mean life. If you choose other, it will certainly mean death. However, believe it or not, all of this uh, talk about the uh, creation and evolution, that's actually not the primary thrust of my commentary. I do want to talk about sin, but I want to briefly talk about the decision to sin from our first parents, and I want to talk about it from a different angle. So this brings me to the second part of my commentary, man's choices. Let's talk about the fall. This next section is entitled, The Fall. It's no secret that the first unfortunate sin of our first parents, Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve are Adam and Chava. It's no secret that what they did affected everyone else. Because their choice left an indelible mark on all of mankind that followed afterwards. They are the parents of humanity. And what they did in the garden, in their disobedience, has affected every man, woman, and child, boy and girl, down to this very day, Jew and Gentile. It does not matter. We are all a part of Adam and Eve. And this mark that we bear, a mark which only Hashem himself would eventually be able to remove, cannot be denied. There's a huge discussion within Christian and Jewish circles, a debate over the original sin issue. You know, are we born with sin or do we just derive sin after we're born? Is it something that we do, that we choose, or is it something that we're born into? Ultimately, it doesn't matter really whether we're born with it or we choose to sin because ultimately... The Bible tells us that all sin, we all choose sin. Eventually, we all become sinners, you know, given enough time. So I suppose it really doesn't matter, even though if, if I had to choose, I would, I would opt for the original sin as seen through the eyes of the Christian uh, camp where we are actually born into it. The rabbis don't like to believe that we are born with original sin because that would suggest that God's creating, uh, you know, of new people, bringing new souls uh, into the world is why would God bring defective souls into the world? The rabbis just can't fathom that. Thus, we have a clever saying that we recite in the uh, in the prayer book during Shacharit prayers, Elohai Neshama Shinatata Bi Tehorahi. The soul that you have given me, O Lord, is a pure one. And so, this notion of original sin is upsetting to the rabbis. Well, the sin of eating of the forbidden fruit of chapter 3 in Genesis of our Torah portion here, it was not just some trivial mistake made on the part of innocent children. I don't think so. I mean, sure, the adversary launched a well-thought-out assault. He attacked the weaknesses of the, f- of the first couple's flesh. He attacked their, their eyes and the pride of life. He actually, if you think about it, and this is kind of a, a preacher's homiletic ex- explanation of 1 John 2.16 that I heard one year. I think it was probably Jerry Falwell, the late Jerry Falwell, who, uh, who brought this sermon. But basically, the adversary attacked um, our first parents through the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And of course, that's taken from 1 John 2.16. Um, and I think it was a very well, very well um, put together sermon. I don't have time to recreate it here for you in my commentary, but I believe that there's a little more to the sinful uh, transaction in uh, Genesis than meets the eye. Okay, so let's study it. In order to see it, then I am going to conduct my own sort of uh, hidden teaching or my own sort of sud teaching. The word sud is a Hebrew uh, term which refers to. Um, things which are hidden or things which are not easily seen. Uh, The rabbis actually derived four different ways which to approach our study of Scripture. And we've got a clever acronym to help us remember what those four ways are. The acronym is pronounced PARDES. It's formed from the P-R-D-S corresponding to the Hebrew ways or the Hebraic way of approaching Scripture. The P stands for Peshat, which is the plain or simple meaning of the text as we encounter the text and we read it. 
the, uh, the you know the logistics of the text, the the who, what, when, where, and why of sorts of the text. That's the Peshat of the P of Pardes. The R stands for Remez, and that's that's where the text isn't really telling us outright what it's trying to get us to understand, but it's hinting at a particular idea. That's what the R is, the Remez, and then the D in the Pardes stands for the Drash or the Midrash. Okay, you ever, you're going to hear me talk about Midrash quite quite a bit in my own commentaries. Midrash or Drash is a searching method of the text. You're not always going to see what the text tells you until you start corresponding this text with that text and and corroborating your information from one side of the passage to the other side and 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 kind of linking things together via phrases and clauses and 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 words and 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 and, and the like that's that's kind of midrash okay it's the searching and then finally the sud is sometimes you find things in the hidden sometimes things that that are 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 kind of um below the surface of the text uh they show up in the gematria in the the numerical value of the hebrew letters uh they show up uh in um peculiar words or phrases they show up in um the conjugations of the verbs that that don't seem to be quite normal at times so that's what i mean by the uh, uh the the sud i'm not so sure that the, what we're going to talk about next is sud it, it might just be midrash but um i thought i'd give you that introduction to um the different wa- the different ways of studying scripture in any way so this hebrew word sud means hidden and it is the rabbinical way of examining a text or word of scripture using the numerical value of a word its proximity to other words in the text or simply a deeper understanding of the word itself linguistically all right so that's why i've chosen that term uh, for this next little exercise. In a lighter sense, this is what etymology seeks to explain, right? Etymology is the study of, of the words and their beginnings and, and their adherence and, and the different conjugations of words. That's etymology. I like etymology, especially when it comes to uh, the Hebrew text. So, um, etymology, as I state in my commentary, is the history of a linguistic form shown by tracing its development since its earliest recorded occurrence in the language where it's found. Let's look at one particular verse, one Pasik. Let's turn to Genesis 3.6. The Torah says in, in Genesis 3.6, quote, When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it had a pleasant appearance, and that the tree was desirable for making one wise, she took some of its fruit and ate. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. End quote. Now the emphasis was mine. If you have the written notes, you'll see that in uh, Genesis 3, 6, I underlined the word, or the phrase, making one wise, and I put the word one in brackets. Um, in Hebrew, the phrase translated as making one wise is really just one word. It's literally, lahaskil. Okay? And the phrase, lahaskil, stems from the Hebrew word, sachal. Okay? Or sakal, I believe. Um, yes, sakal. Now, this word... This verb, sakal, um, in the phrase that we have, lahas kiel, it's actually conjugated into a, a different form. Do you know what I mean when I say conjugation? Um, let me just look up a dictionary defin- definition of the word conjugate real quick for you. Because some people ask, and I've explained it in my own terms, but let's just look up a dictionary, dictionary definition. According to the dictionary here, conjugate means... Um, it means to give the different forms of a verb in an inflected language as they vary according to voice, mood, tense, number, and person. So that's what conjugate means, all right? Now you'll know, and the next time you ask me, you can uh, take the definition that I gave you as straight from the dictionary. But this verb here, sakal, is conjugated in what is known as the he feel stem. All right, now let me just pause and explain this conjugation from a Hebrew. The Hebrew language or Hebrew verbs find themselves conjugated into seven main different forms. Okay, we go from like a simple form down to more complex forms where the verb goes through those inflections, mood, voices, tenses, etc. Look at my footnote to number two. The he feel, according to the Blue Letter Bible Tools, and there's a link there if you have the written notes or if you're looking at this online, you can actually click on that and it should take you to the Blue Letter Bible Tools. The he feel stem in the Hebrew, 
the conjugation form, is defined as usually expressing the causative action of the simplified call stem. All right? Call, Q-A-L, is the simplest form that the verb will find itself in. In Hebrew, this usually is in the past tense, meaning it's a, it's a perfected tense verb, past tense. It's a completed action. So the he feel of the call... In, the, in that version, the, he, the call he feel, the simplified he feel stem, according to our example, uh, for, they, they get three examples. He ate, he caused to eat, he fed, that's one version. He came, he caused to come, he brought, that's a second uh, example. Or he reigned, he made king, he crowned. See, those, those are call and the he feel. That's one. That's the first part of the definition of what this uh, verbal stem tries to convey to its English readers. He feel, according to the second um, part of this definition, is often used to form verbs from nouns and adjectives. And they give you some examples here. In a noun or the adjective he feel, we have example number one, ear to listen or lend an ear. It's a Hebrew idiom. He has an ear to listen. He lent an ear. That's what it means. Or the second example, they said, far to remove oneself. That is to say, to put far away. That's what the idiom means. And then they give you one third um, definition of the he fill. They let you know that some simple verbs are found in he fill. And then they give you an example to cast, to destroy, to get up early, to explain, to tell. Um, the particular he fill form accounts for 13.3% of the verbs that are parsed in the Tanakh, and that's um, that's according to the Blue Letter Bible Tools. So this phrase, making one wise, lahaskil, comes from the Hebrew verb sakal, and and in the form that we read in the sentence there, lahaskil is actually a conjugation of the word sakal. And so it's in its he fills them, and it generally causes the subject to become something that they previously were not. In essence, it adds to the quality of the original form. That's according to the BDB. That's why it's called causative. Okay? Are you following me so far? I hope I'm not confusing you. Now, how is this significant to you, the reader? Why do you care? Well, consider this. This is Eve we're talking about, right? It says that when the woman saw... Up until the eating of the forbidden fruit, Eve had been creative, created complete. Our first parents were created complete. They lacked no wisdom. God created them exactly with the proper amount of wisdom and knowledge that they needed at this point. They were created perfect. Okay, they, God did not create them inadequate. He created them and gave them instructions. And they were to follow these instructions according to God's design. But but for some reason, they were brought to the place where they believed themselves to lack something. Now this is not only a lie, but it is an affront on the creative genius of God himself. To suggest that we are created lacking something, that's wrong. Now think about it. Man was perfect at his creation. To be sure, Adam was able to name all of the animals with the wisdom that Hashem created him with. Adam named all of the animals? If we were to take this passage literally, and not hyperbole, where it's just kind of an exaggerated statement, you have to think about it. Even today, our smartest specialists cannot do the same without the aid of materials of some sort. Ask any person who who is a uh, who knows anything about animals? Ask someone who's a specialist. Ask them to name all the animals. They they can't do it without a list. Adam was able to do it first-handedly, and he did it without any computers, any 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 clever books. He didn't have any special list. God said, "Adam, call the animals their name by their name, and whatever you name them, they'll be named that." And Adam was able to name them. Wow, Adam was pretty smart, don't you think? In fact, scientists today suggest that we don't use all of our brain capacity. I can't remember what the percentage is. If, I think it's something like we only use, what, 10% of our brain or a, a very, very small percent of our brain capacity. Is it possible maybe that before the fall, 
that Adam was able to actually tap into the full capacity of his brain power that God created him with. And that's why he was a lot smarter than we are today. Yeah, I think so. So, God endowed them with all the wisdom that they needed at that point. The wisdom that they possessed was exactly the amount that Hashem knew they needed. You see, when the adversary suggested that Eve, that Chava's wisdom was lacking in some manner. You remember? Go back, go back and look. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 3. And um, uh, it's in verse 4. Pasuk 4, chapter 3. This, this is out of the, uh, st- uh, the uh, art scroll edition, Tanakh. The serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that on the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and bad. Now, did you catch the clever um, insinuation in his statement? This, the adversary is suggesting to Chava that God held back. God didn't give you all that you need to have. God held back the knowledge of good and evil from you. And so, you're really not perfect, Eve. You're defective. And the only way that you're going to fix the problem of your defect is for you to taste some of the fruit that God said don't eat or God said don't touch. That's a different midrash. You've heard sermons that say that God said don't touch of it, but uh, but um, God said don't eat of it, but at, uh, uh, Eve added the phrase don't touch or eat. That is true. She added to God's word, and that is, that's sin as well. But I believe that there's more at stake here than, than her just adding to... Um, what God actually said. Maybe God did tell her um, not to touch it and we just don't have it written down for us. I'm not sure about that. We do know that she disobeyed and that is clearly a violation of God's command. But notice here that the devil, the adversary, is 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 insulting God's creative uh, genius. He's insulting God's creation. Oh no, Eve. I'm just paraphrasing, obviously. Oh no, Eve. Nope, you're defective. You've got a problem. And if you want to fix your problem, you need to go ahead and just take the, your t- take 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 your own initiative and 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 eat of that tree so you can fix the problem that God uh, uh, gave to you. You know that God created you with. How 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 rude of God not to create you with everything that you needed to survive. How how dare He create you with a defect? No, Eve. I think you need to take matters into your own hands and uh, just go ahead and eat that 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 forbidden fruit. You know, and and go ahead and put back into you that which you're lacking. Are you seeing beginning to see it here? In other words, how is it that the devil was able to trick Chava into thinking that the tree would make her wiser than she already was to begin with? You see, by understanding today that she was tricked into doubting the providence of her creator, I think we begin to understand why Hashem was so disappointed at the simple act of eating from a tree. Are you seeing it now? It is true that it was also blatant disobedience, but I believe that a primary mistake of the first couple was to mistakenly believe that in taking unto themselves a substance reported to possess wisdom, which they lacked, or which they thought they lacked, they could somehow improve on God's original design. The lie of the adversary. And you know what's the same lie today? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. The adversary today is trying to constantly trick man into thinking that there is something greater out there awaiting man if he will just embrace the hidden wisdom, the, the, uh, the Gnostic wisdom that the devil is trying to offer us. You can be like God, the devil says. Just do this, do that. And the problem remains when man listens to the lie of the adversary instead of believing that God has all the answers. Looking back at our first parents, quite simply, they believed, as the adversary did unknown eons earlier, that they could be like the Most High. That's, of course, lifted from Isaiah 14.14 from the KJV. What conclusions can we draw to our commentary today? Well... We surely know that there is a problem and it was introduced way back in the garden. Let's talk about this and let's also look towards the solution. This final section in my commentary is called Conclusion. We know from both the adversary's example as well as from the numerous examples of people that have been 
recorded in the Tanakh and in other places that equality with God is a serious offense. It's serious. God will not put up with it. Attributing power unto another created being, power that belongs only to the Most High God, is labeled blasphemy. Blasphemy. That's why the Jewish people, by the way, are so upset at the Christian notion that Jesus is God. How dare you attribute, they say, the power reserved to Hashem, the Holy One, Hakadosh Baruch Hu, how dare you attribute this power to a created man known as Jesus. They can't understand the mystery of the Incarnation, that Jesus is 100% man, that's right. But he's 100% God. Let's talk about that a little later, right? The lust of the flesh... Remember that the adversary tricked Eve into thinking that this was good for food. The lust of the flesh, the sustenance that, that she thought it would, would add to her flesh, to her belly. The lust of the eyes. Remember the passage says that it was pleasing in its appearance, this, this fruit, whatever it was. It was a, the, the lust of the eyes. These are bad enough temptations in and of themselves, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes. I mean, just those two alone are enough to bring your average man down, Right? In and of themselves, then, you know, again, they're enough to, to, to really just uh, wipe a person out. That, that's, that's part of our, our problem today, is the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes. And, and because they're so bad in and of themselves, then we should strive to avoid them. But when we get involved with this third one, the pride of life. I'm playing with that passage in First John again, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. This third one, the pride of life. Remember what did the what did the passage say? It is desirable for making one wise. The pride of man, the wisdom that man seeks after, making one wise. I think it's there that when uh, that man really starts going downhill, when when it's this third one that we're bitten by. That you know, it, it, these three sins are really bad. I mean, I'm not saying that these are the the worst of the worst. I'm just just making a midrash, okay? The lust of the flesh, good for food. The lust of the eyes, pleasant in appearance. And the pride of life, desirable for making one wise. Eve was in a bad position, and Adam was no better because he followed suit with his wife. He ate the forbidden fruit that he knew that God had commanded him not to eat. This means Adam must also have suffered from these same three temptations. I believe he knew. I believe he knew better. And so, at least we could say that the woman was tricked. But Adam, what was his excuse? I don't think he had one. So, borrowing again from Isaiah 14, the Torah tells us that it was pride that brought the adversary down from his prestigious position of leadership. Remember, it was pride. The devil said to himself, I will be like the Most High. The adversary assumed, or presumed, or, or, or envisioned that he could be equal to God. No, the devil thought that he could be greater than God. This is a serious offense. Equality with God. It's not to be played with people. You can also read Ezekiel 28 verses 1 through 19 for more about the fall of the adversary so long ago. You know, let's, let's draw a comparison. The adversary gives us an example of what we should not endeavor, what we should not strive to have, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. We are to be satisfied with how we've been created. God created us perfect. And in our fall, in our, in our fallen state, God still created us with the ability to come back to himself. And how do we find God again? By looking to the perfect man that God has sent into our history. A man has been born from history. A man has been born among us from the lineage of Adam who shares with us the, 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 the substance that Adam has. He's human. But this man was endowed with the wisdom from on high. Let's turn to Philippians 2, verses 5 through 11. It says, quote, well, just in verse 6, it says, quote, Though he was in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God something to be possessed by force. End quote. Who's it talking about there? 
course, the passage is talking about the man, Yeshua, from Nazareth. Did he clamor after power that was not his? Did he, did he yearn for a wisdom that was not given to him? No. Did he yearn for a wisdom that was not his? No. What did the Pasuk say? Though he was in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God something to be possessed by force. Something which the adversary did regard. Remember? That was the devil's fall. He thought to himself, I'm created, but I can be like the creator. This is drastically different from what is recorded of the Messiah here in Philippians. Our Lord Yeshua has no reason to be jealous of the Father's power. He has no reason to desire that which is not His. Neither is there any room for pride. Why? Because Yeshua the Messiah, unlike the adversary, unlike our first parents, Yeshua is one in purpose and will with the Father. Yeah. You see, Yeshua is our perfect example he is the, the, the solution to the problem plaguing every single man born after Adam's sin. Our first parents would have done well if they could have followed the example of our Lord Yeshua. Now, of course, I realize that that's an anachronistic su- uh, suggestion. Yeshua came after our parents. But Yeshua's life example was the perfect one, even though his Example is yet history. Hashem's ultimate plan would be demonstrated by sending His Son to take on hu- a human form, take on uh, the nature of humanity, and yet Yeshua chose not to sin. He did not. He did not reach for that which was not His, because it was His. The wisdom from on high was already His. He laid it aside to come to Earth. And because of his his obedience to God the Father, at his resurrection, he was granted that which was already his in the beginning, the wisdom of God. You see, Hashem's ultimate plan was not thwarted by the likes of an ancient snake. The adversary thought that by tricking our first parents, that um, that he would ruin the plans that God had already plan you know the, the 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 plans that God had already uh, designed from the beginning when he created man that there would be a perfect man who would um who would redeem fallen man God in his in his in his infant knowledge knew that man would need a uh, need a messiah need a uh, um a redeemer and so the adversary tried to stop that plan but Yeshua succeeded. Hashem graciously for our parents provided a covering for their nakedness in chapter 3 verse 21. And he justifiably meted out the appropriate punishment for each of them in chapter 3 verses 14 through 19. In fact, God in his mercy even provided the first scriptural messianic prophecy and he gave it to them right there in chapter 3 verse 15. He told them, of a future descendant of theirs who would come and who would crush the seed of the serpent. He would crush his head. There would be enmity between the woman's seed and the seed of the serpent, but that ultimately this promised one to come would crush the head of the serpent. If we were to continue to read through the rest of the parasha, we would see that it's given over to the genealogies of the first family, chapter 4, verses 1 through 532. Uh, the ongoing consequences of the introduction of sin into the world, chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. And then the first murder in chapter 4, verse 8. We also see the uh, beginning of God's continuing plan of righteousness established through seed. And this is in chapter 6, verse 8. But as we draw my commentary to a close, let me just say this. Since the Messiah has provided a more permanent covering than the animals that God provided for the uh, uh, our first parents there in the garden. Messiah has provided us a more permanent covering for our transgressions than the animals could ever cover. Then we as believers today do in fact have an example that we can follow. We're not like Adam and Eve where, we, where everything is yet future. I'm speaking in the 21st century and the Messiah has come. 
and he has made a way whereby we can resist the temptations of the adversary. And oh yes, don't get me wrong, the adversary is still at work. He's still up to his old tricks. And because he's older than any one of us, we don't stand a chance against him except by the grace and the mercy of God and by the power of the Holy Spirit. The adversary is, is, the, is that ancient serpent and he is still up to his old tricks. He is still attempting to try and um, get man to fall into the age-old lie of believing that we can be made wiser than we, than, than we really suppose that we are. He still tempts us with the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. It's the same old tricks. And since as believers, this mind which was in Messiah Yeshua is in us, since we have the mind of Messiah in us, read Philippians 2.15, then we need, I'm sorry, Philippians 2.5, we need not give in to the old lie of trying to be wiser than we really are, or wiser than we already are. We have been endowed with the perfect amount of wisdom from on high that God knows that we need. Okay? Hashem has mercifully endowed us with wisdom from on high and we can be gracious and thankful for that. Don't clamor for more than God has given you. Expect the best. That's right. But let God meet it out to you. Read his word and believe the promises that everything that he has, has planned for you is for your good. Don't believe the lie of the adversary. Let us live our lives in the richness of the truth of his word. Amen. Oh, man. Let's close the blessing. Uh, let's close the Torah portion with the closing blessing. Uh, I'm not going to chant it. I'll just go ahead. I'm not going to, yeah, I'm not going to chant it. I'll just go ahead and read it. And then from here on out, I'll just read each opening and closing blessing, okay? Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam, asher natan lanu torrat emet vechaye olam nata batochinu. Baruch atah Adonai noten ha Torah. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe. You have given us your Torah of truth, and have planted everlasting life within our midst. Blessed are you, Lord, giver of the Torah. Amen. And with that, I wish you a hearty Shabbat Shalom. That concludes our show for today. Remember, because the Messiah has already come, the Torah is now a document meant to be lived out in the life of a faithful follower of Yeshua through the power of the Ruach HaKodesh to the glory of God the Father. It should not be presumed that it can be obeyed mechanically, automatically, legalistically, without having faith, without having trust in Hashem, without having love for God or man, and without being empowered by the Ruach HaKodesh. To state it succinctly, Torah observance is a matter of the heart, always has been, and always will be. My name is Torah teacher Ariel Ben Lyman Hanavi. The intro and outro song Shema was written, produced, and performed by Ryan Kingsley. For information on contacting Ryan, you can reach me by email at Yeshua613 at hotmail.com. That's Y E S H U A number 613 at hotmail.com or visit our website at graftedin.com that's graftedin.com